Hey everybody, thank you for dropping into DeFi Divi. My name is Matthew. Welcome and glad you are here. On this channel, we like to talk about simple crypto passive income strategies that are implemented on blockchains with utility, use cases, and that's all business problems. If you like that type of content, subscribe here or follow me right down here at DeFi Divi on Twitter. As always, none of this is investment advice. I am not an investment advisor. Always do your own research outside this channel. Exciting video today. We are going to talk about the state connector. Not only are we going to talk about how powerful this thing is for enhancing, just growing blockchain usability and in uh, the number of use cases, but we're going to talk about Flare's approach to security with this thing. It's a really important concept when you're talking about oracles and ways to get external data into a chain. Right now, a lot of the solutions out there, you really just have to trust a centralized oracle that's working on top of a blockchain. Flare's approach is decentralized, trustless data coming in. And so we're going to talk about all that and how they're uh, and their approach to security. So that's super exciting. I got the idea for this video from a post by uh, at Mr. Fresh Time on Twitter. That's Mickey B. Fresh and team. I uh, highly recommend following that account for in-depth, in-depth Flare knowledge really makes you think that channel so if you're into going super deep give that channel a subscribe but first let's go over this article on coindesk about flare this section right here making blockchain more more useful and it talks a bit about the state connector and how it can enhance use cases so uh and i quote making blockchain more useful According to Hugo Fillion, CEO and co-founder of Flare, we need more useful decentralized applications. Flare is tackling this through data, not just prices, but transaction details, Web2 events, etc., so that developers can build applications that provide more utility to larger groups of users. And I love that because ultimately... I, most people are not going to probably end up being into crypto. I mean... They will and they won't. And from an investment standpoint, it'll probably be mo approached just like most stock investors or real estate investors. You know, a handful of the population does it, and most people either just put it into an index fund or don't even think about it, or a lot of people just don't invest at all. But as far as the general population, no way do I believe we're all going to be paying for things in flare tokens or any other cryptocurrency you can think of. But what, what I do believe is that under the hood, these tokens will be used and people won't even know they're using them. And that ties into what Hugo just wrote right here. So that developers can build applications that provide more utility to larger groups of users. There is still a lack of real world utility being observed at scale in Web3 technologies due in part to a lack of securely acquired off-chain data available for use in on-chain apps. Decentralized access to high-integrity data from other blockchains and Web2 internet sources enables the creation of new use cases and monetization models. The Flare Time Series article and the State Connector make more types of off-chain data available for use in on-chain dApps securely, scalably, and trustlessly. And then the third paragraph also mentions who benefits uh, talking about how not just developers are the ones to benefit from this. And I quote, but developers are not the only ones who will be able to take advantage of improved data oracle tooling. Participants in data DAOs and machine learning practitioners wanting to develop and sell algorithms and data sets or make use of data unions need, need a means of porting data. The users of both DeFi and NFT protocols also stand to win as token exchanges increasingly take up and make use of accurate, fast, and decentralized price feeds. Data oracles and protocols that power them will play an increasingly important role in achieving real-world utility in the future of decentralized economy by helping developers to obtain securely acquired off-chain data available for use in on-chain apps. I know he says dApps. I just like to call them apps. So yeah, some great use cases right there mentioned. And with machine learning, I know we're going to, I have a feeling we're going to be hearing a lot about AI tokens, this bull run, as this upcoming bull run. And there are so many other use cases too when you're talking about Web2 data. I mean, imagine being able to tie into, and this is coming, you'd be able to read all types of different data from Web2, Web2 sources 
and have that data validated in a decentralized manner. For example, what would be something like, let's say you wanted to build an app that transfers your digital assets upon the time you were deceased to whoever, whomever you want to transfer them to. And so that Web2 data is probably publicly available, and, but it also would need to be verified in a trustless, decentralized manner. And then that Web, once verified through the state connector, it could initiate a smart contract trigger, which transfers those assets. That's one possible app. Or imagine the ability to read Web2 data from uh, sports betting sites or stock price feeds or real estate market prices, notes, mortgage notes. The sky's the limit here. And if that data can be captured in a decentralized manner for accurate trustless price data, and then dApps are built, smart contract applications are built to do things based on those prices, based on price movements, based on anything, based on the score of a game, based on the spread of a football game. So that takes us to the topic of security and how do we trust that this data coming from these Web2 sources is in fact verified in a decentralized manner, trustlessly, and, who's, and why couldn't it be manipulated? Let's talk about Flair's approach to that based on this tweet by uh, Mickey B. Fresh that I mentioned earlier. And I quote, Flair equals base layer for data. Flair is built to enable open, decentralized, and safe op interoperability between blockchains and also between blockchains and Web2 APIs. Lack of real-world utility in Web3 is the lack of securely acquired off-chain data available for use in on-chain apps. Yeah, so we just sort of talked about that in the article as well. And then in this interview, Hugo talks about Flair's approach. So we'll go over what, what Hugo's saying right here, and then I'll break it down on a slide I created. Maybe I can simplify it a little bit as well. It, just creating the slide helped me understand it, so hopefully it will help you. But here's Hugo talking about how in addition to staking, there is a second mechanism because staking alone is not enough to secure the state connector. And we'll talk about why. The state connector has a binary forking mechanism. This allows any minority set within the state connector, so the validators of the network, to essentially, uh, if, if, if the system becomes corrupt, to basically say the system is corrupt, we're not approving this new data. Here is a new version of Flare, which does not have the bad data embedded. This is the old version. This is the new version. And obviously, anyone that cares about essentially the data, about the applications that are leveraged from that data, about the value connected to that, they will migrate from the corrupt version to the, to the, to the version that does not have the bad data. So not only do we have the base staking uh, security, we have an additional level of security that allows in, a, uh, in a, a, a case where the system itself becomes undermined, malicious. It allows uh, the, the system to essentially rectify itself without uh, causing loss to the applications and the users that are using that system. We're most proud of that. Because relative to other systems, whether you call it an oracle or whether you call it a, an interoperability protocol, everything else is secured just with money. And we think, those, um, we think that security premise essentially is fundamentally flawed. Okay, so you're, you're switching the model from just trust to put a stake in the game. Well, we're, switching really. the money, we're switching the model from just money to money plus an ability to dissent and to create a clean network that does not have this bad data on it. So let's break that down. It's pretty uh, intuitive what he's saying here, but basically, if you look at this slide, this represents the state connector, and here represents a bunch of different, different staked values in the state connector to help secure the network. So this would be the base layer of security, staking, which alone is not enough is what Hugo's saying. And here's why. So like he mentioned it, 
I think earlier in that video as well, if you're staking, let's say you are staking, you have a validator and you have a, um, 100 million flare tokens staked to help secure the network, but someone comes to you and says, hey, if you report a transaction that is false for $1 billion, it will actually, in a way, make a lot more money than your 100 million and I will kick it in, I will kick you in on it. And so there's an incentive for a staker to be malicious. And if enough of those stakers are incentivized, you're losing a stake here, you're losing a stake here. And now look, you have much fewer staked. So the network's already becoming less secure. And the fewer people that are staking, maybe some of these people are also going, well, I'm just going to go stake on a different network anyways, because their rewards are better. So they might be, they might leave here. And now this, this thing looks a lot more vulnerable. Now there's, it's a lot less decentralized, easier to attack. This guy was manipulated up here. And so this thing looks pretty weak right now. But what Hugo's saying, that's just the base one level. And that's what a lot of proof of stake is. That's sort of, and that's the problem with it that Flair is solving. But he's talking about his binary forking mechanism that's also built into the network. So what happens is a small group of these entities, these validators, understand, hey, the network's been compromised. So what we need to do is we need to go ahead and just create a brand new fork, binary fork. We have consensus that this is, this one is no good. This is the new one. And then Hugo's saying you are, you, your apps will need to be migrated over to the new one. That's the only part that I don't love, but I don't see another way around that right now. So basically right here, your app will be able to point away from that compromised one over to this new one. And I love that. That's huge. The only thing I don't like about it is, I, I, and maybe there is, I don't know. I have to dig deeper into this. If there's a way that the, the word migration doesn't mean you have to go ahead and update your application code base with a bunch of new API calls to a new network. Probably, I don't see how you could get around that. You know, that is what it is. So there could be a little downtime there. Other than that, though, that is an extra layer of security in addition to staking that keeps things running pretty smoothly and and correct me maybe i'm maybe i'm incorrectly stating that hugo mentioned the word migrate and that you'll be incentive to migrate so it makes me think you'll have to do some work on your app to move to change it to point from this compromised app this compromised network to the the network that has not been compromised. Now, it'd be great if all the endpoint data and everything internally to this app could just stay the same somehow. Maybe something has changed under the hood and no migration is required, but I, I, there's probably some flaws in that idea as well. I'm sure there is. This is, this is the stuff, type of stuff that requires deep thinking. It's not easy solutions. The fact that there is this added layer, this binary forking mechanism, so you have a new state connector network right here, just forked from the old one. So this has bad data, this one has good data, and now all DAP developers change their DAPs to point to the new one. Could be just a simple minor migration. If the apps are built well, really, it should be just changing like one endpoint somewhere and redeploying your code and telling everybody to update it. But yeah, that's it. Really powerful stuff, really powerful security mechanisms for Flare. Probably the most secure approach I've seen from any sort of Oracle, especially one that can read and validate web two data in a decentralized manner. Great stuff. I love it. Just a quick one. Uh, thanks again to Mickey B fresh for posting that. And that's it. I'm going to wrap this one up everyone. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.